Hello, thank you for joining me. Uh, my name is Peter Besson. I'm a current master's student at Southern Illinois University, uh, finishing up my second year here. Uh, this is part of my thesis study. Uh, we looked at Asian carp hydrolysis as an initial dietary protein source for the successful production of yellow perch. So one thing the study looked at um, first was producing a hydrolyzed protein uh, method. Um, so we were looking at protein sizes, um, this intact protein here. Uh, it's a long chain. It's particularly hard for many larvae to digest. Um, early on in life, they're, they're pretty limited in terms of the sizes of proteins they can um, efficiently utilize. Um, however, early on in life, they have this increased ability to um, uptake and utilize these hydrolyzed proteins um, more efficiently than, than later on after they metamorphosis. Um, and so this hydrolyzed protein here in the middle, these di and tripeptides, free amino acids, um, we've seen in other species, um, uptake has been more efficient and early on in life um, as opposed to these intact proteins um, after they've really developed their digestive system um, after metamorphosing. So just a little overview of protein hydrolysis. Um, it's essentially just a method for cleaving proteins into smaller peptides, these di and tripeptides, free amino acids. Um, like I said, in some studies in other species, they've supported significant growth performance over intact proteins. Um, at some inclusion rates, um, high inclusion rates, they have actually been seen to um, be less effective than, than intact proteins. Um, so finding that right percentage um, is probably species specific um, and life stage specific. Um, one thing we, we try to focus on here as well is creating this, um, not only a species specific feed, but also a life stage specific feed um, to really utilize and take advantage of anything we can in terms of their digestive capacity um, or their, their changing digestive development. Um, and one thing we also looked at was this the enzyme specificity. Um, so the enzymes are secreted when food is digested um, and the type of enzyme secreted and the food ingested um, is, is um, very specific to the final protein profile and bioavailability of the protein. Um, so we wanted to look at species specific enzymes. So we looked at yellow perch enzymes um, to break down our intact protein as well in hopes that it would match uh, the larval requirements for uptaking these proteins um, and utilizing them in an efficient manner. So specifically the objectives of this study were to obtain hydrolysis derived from silver carp uh, muscle using adult yellow perch digestive tracts. Um, in hopes to generate an optimal protein source for yellow perch larvae. Um, as well, we wanted to evaluate the effect of dietary inclusions of this hydrolysis on growth, survival, morphological, and molecular responses of the gut. So as I mentioned, the enzyme source is very important to the final protein profile um, of the feed. So when we're breaking down the intact protein with a species-specific enzyme, we, we hope that it can be more bioavailable to that larvae. Um, and so that's what we did. We took the stomachs um, and intestine from these adult yellow perch and we combined it with the Asian carp muscle uh, before digesting it in a stomach um, acidity of 3 to 4 pH uh, for 60 minutes. And then from there, we did our intestinal digestion uh, for 120 minutes. Uh, we did end up doubling these times because we just found it time consuming to collect um, these stomachs. We didn't have very large adult perch at the time, so it took a lot more time to harvest these um, intestines and uh, stomach sources. Um, from there, we heat shocked it to stop any enzymatic activity, uh, freeze dried it, and then stored it for later use. Um, as well, our intact protein here, this was sort of our control for the study. Uh, we combined our uh, digestive tracts and our muscle, um, and then we just skipped the digestive part that, that few hours of um, simulated digestion. And then we heat shocked it to prevent any of the enzymes present in the muscle from breaking down that feed. Um, and from there, we did the same. We freeze dried and stored for later use. So for our design for this study, we had three replicates per treatment. Uh, we fed four to six times each day to satiation. Uh, we had about 4,000 larvae in each tank, or about 65 larvae per liter, uh, 280 liter tanks. Uh, we had four diets on here on the right. Uh, the colors will match throughout the rest of the presentation. Uh, we had our test diet, our silver carp hydrolysis, our control diet, our silver carp intact, and then two reference diets, one the live feed, uh, kind of just to simulate that traditional uh, rearing um, and to cross-reference that. And then secondly, um, our commercial diet, which was autohime. Uh, one thing about autohime is it does contain hydrolysis, um, so it, it is somewhat comparable in a way, um, but at the same time, these are from marine sources. Um, and so it's, it's multiple different sources of marine uh, species. Um, it's hydrolyzed. Um, it's very high quality, um, also very expensive. 
Um, so when we look at the results later, that's one thing to keep in mind is that our silver carp hydrolysis was simply um, silver carp. So we used an invasive species um, and we used extra fish um, that were left over from uh, from previous study. Um, so keep that in mind, you know, in terms of when we compare them, they're not directly comparable in terms of the autoheme and hydrolysis, uh, but it is good to see how they how they stack up against each other um, and how they perform, um, even though um, one is using high quality marine sources um, and one is using invasive species um, on its own. So here are our test diet formulations. We used a couple um, different sources to guide us here. Uh, a previous study we did uh, a couple years ago with largemouth bass, um, and then also some other studies that indicated larvae um, can have beneficial effects on larvae uh, with less than 50% inclusion of hydrolysate. Uh, so we stuck with the 32% uh, inclusion here of hydrolysate in our test diet, um, and then combining that with the rest with intact protein um, from that silver carp uh, to give us a comparable amount of protein in each diet, about 57%. Uh, and then here our control diet is that 57%, uh, just intact protein, no hydrolysis included. So some of you may know, uh, live feed stages can be pretty variable uh, depending on your system and how well uh, that culture is taking off in your pond. Uh, for example, in ponds, they can be one month, two months. Um, in the tandem systems where you bring them inside for feed training, it can be um, about four weeks or so. Uh, in RAS systems or indoor systems, it can be uh, 12 to 30 days, uh, simply just because uh, the larvae are more concentrated in one area, uh, so they're able to find food easier um, as well as more frequently. Um, they're not only able to find it more frequently, but you're able to feed more frequently um, and observe it um, a, lot, a lot easier than in ponds. Um, so you can really tell when you fed enough. Um, if they've eaten enough live feed, you can really see it in their stomachs. Um, and this is one of those advantages of, of moving indoors um, into tanks. Uh, but we tried to simulate that the traditional indoor system um, somewhat as, as we fed our rotifers to all groups uh, from 9 to 10 dph and then from 11 to 12 days post hatch we uh, started to introduce our artemia uh, always feeding it before our rotifers to try to encourage that transition um, and then from 13 to 15 dph we, we were on only artemia um, and then again we started to introduce our diets so so we've had the same diet regimen um, up until this point um, across the board um, but from here, from 16 to 19 dph, we uh, started to introduce our diets. Uh, same deal in terms of introducing that diet first um, and then supplementing with our artemia on those days, um, at the end of, towards the end of the day, usually. Uh, and then from 19 to 32 tbh, um, we, we had only our dry diets, so we were solely on our hydro intact commercial, uh, and then our live feed, lastly, continued to be our artemia. Uh, from 32 dph, that was when our study ended. Uh, that's sort of that that time when they, they began to metamorphose um, and we were we were sure they were uh, completely um, through that stage. So we did make some modifications to our larval system. Uh, we had sprayers here at 45 degrees and 90 um, and these help to uh, break the surface tension of the water and this helps the larvae inflate their swim bladders. Um, so just one tool to help uh, alleviate some of those challenges with larval rearing. Uh, we had 100% swim bladder inflation, um, and breaking that surface tension of the water, we think, really helps those fragile small larvae um, gulp air and inflate those swim bladders. Uh, secondly, we had this clay. Uh, this, this helps with the cannibalism as well as cleaning behavior. This cleaning behavior sort of looks um, like the fish stacked up on the wall here, um, and from there, they, they generally won't eat. They're stressed out, um, possibly because of a cannibal in the tank, which is usually inevitable. Um, and then secondly, it could be because of the light refracting in the water, um, and sort of spooking the fish um, from, from the surrounding environment as well as other fish. Um, and then next we have our screens. Uh, we had variable screen sizes, so above the water column here um, is a slightly larger screen to allow for that oil to pass through, so these oils will build up uh, during that swim bladder inflation process uh, as well as from the feeds. Um, and then a smaller screen, um, obviously the smaller than the larvae so they can't escape here. Um, and then next we have our laminar flow. Uh, we used about two to three liters per minute um, at the start, slowly increasing that towards the end of the trial. Um, but this laminar flow really prolongs that feed in the water um, as well as the dry feed. Um, and then our, our conditions of the tank, we had our temperature at 18 to 22 degrees Celsius uh, for, the, for the whole study. Our salinity was at one to two PPT during these live feed stages. 
Uh, so, so during the live feeds, uh, since they are marine organisms, uh, that one to two PPT can, uh, it's worth adding that salt uh, to prolong that live feed, um, allowing it to move around um, longer, um, help the larvae find that prey, as well as make it more attractive. If it's, if it's alive and moving around, the larvae are, are more likely to find it um, and eat it as well. Uh, and then our pH was seven to seven and a half. Uh, and lastly, we have lights above each tank. So these lights um, are cues for the larvae. Uh, to feed. Uh, so we'll turn them on during feedings um, and then off or dimmed at other hours. Um, and these um, also help with uh, sort of their regulating their cycles, so their biological functions. Um, when they when they have a certain rhythm of light and darkness, um, this can help with, with many digestive and biological functions, um, as well as, like I said, gives them a feeding cue for when you're feeding um, it kind of it's an, a source of attraction for the larvae. Um, they they swim towards it, um, and therefore when you're putting feed in the water when you're feeding, they're they're swimming towards the feed already when they uh, when the lights are on. Uh, so for our live feed stages here from 9 to 15 dph, we did see an increased mortality in the intact group uh, compared to the other groups, um, but this heightened mortality in all, across all groups isn't uncommon. Um, we did end our study with about 50% uh, survival in our in our hydrolysis and commercial groups. Um, however, from these transition days, we did also see a trend in the intact group. Uh, it seems like they didn't accept this intact protein as well as the other diets. Um, and then from our 19 to 32 DPH, when we were just on dry diet, uh, we saw this trend of the live feed here in blue um, started to raise in, in mortality. I mean, this could be simply because of the energy requirements um, of those fish. Um, sort of that question of uh, can we provide enough live feed um, labor-wise, um, effort-wise uh, to the fish at this stage, um, which is one of those main reasons we really want to be on this dry feed um, as quickly as possible um, in the production. Now, so another way to look at this is cumulative average mortality um, across the whole study. Um, just another way to look at it. So we see our intact group here um, with a noticeably higher mortality uh, than, than the other groups. Um, as I mentioned, the hydrolysis and commercial groups uh, perform similarly, around 50% survival. Um, and then our live feed group, um, as I mentioned, sort of began to increase here at the end of the study when those energy requirements may have just been too high. Um, another thing, we didn't observe any uh, deformities across all groups. Uh, we had 100% swim bladder inflation, so it, it makes it a little easier to determine that this may have been nutritionally related rather than uh, many of the challenges with larval rearing um, system-wise. And then our length and weight measurements, uh, we saw strong trends uh, comparing the live feeds, uh, hydrolysis, and commercial diets. Uh, they all performed pretty similarly. Um, there wasn't a, a significant difference, um, less than 0.05 over um, 0.06. Um, and then here we see our intact group was um, around, around two millimeters shorter uh, than our other groups, as well our weights. Um, no significant differences here. However, there was strong trends in terms of our, our commercial diet performed best that auto uh, They were around 65 uh, milligrams uh, at the end of the study, as well our hydrolysis was right under that um, at around 60 milligrams. Um, and then there are live feeds, and then lastly our intact diet. Uh, so when we look at the morphology of the gut, we were looking for um, Differences in surface area of villi. These villi are essentially what the larvae use to uptake these proteins. Um, however, we didn't see any significant differences or trends here. Uh, we were hoping to see some sort of indication that this hydro group uh, was was different morphologically um, in a way uh, and better utilizing this protein uh, because of that uh, increased surface area. But we didn't see any trends here in the villi. Um, and in the villi, uh, we, we didn't see um, any significant trends, as I mentioned, but uh, in the lamin appropriate thickness, uh, which is another um, area of the gut, uh, we did see somewhat of a trend in the hydro group. It was uh, numerically uh, the thickest thickest group. Um, and this has been also seen in other fish larvae to be a, a direct sign of early maturation of the gut, uh, which is really what we're hoping for in terms of the hydrolysis uh, properties. Um, in some other fish, this uh, lamin appropriate thickness can be directly proportionate to the age of the fish. So this was one promising result. However, we didn't see a, a significant difference, um, but very close, uh, 0.06 here. Just in conclusion, the silver carp hydrolysis uh, didn't have any significant effect when comparing weight and lengths. 
but there was a strong trend in the length category. Uh, they were the longest fish group out of the four. As well, their survival was uh, comparable to the Autohime group, uh, around 50%. We also observed a mortality trend um, heightened in the intact group. Uh, during this weaning phase, uh, they may not have readily accepted that intact protein or uh, may have not utilized it as well. Um, next, the life feed group, we did see that increased mortality after 21 DPH. Uh, as I mentioned, it could be an energy requirement. Uh, once these fish are, are at that stage and, and larger than the beginning, uh, it could simply be because of the effort required to supply that much live feed um, to those fish at that stage. And then the hydro group didn't produce any significant differences in histology, uh, but we did see that lamina propria thickness uh, was largest numerically in the hydro group. Um, and as we know, this, this has been uh, examined and related to fish age directly. Um, next, across the board and all groups, we saw 100% some better inflation and no observable deformities. Um, so this really supports our modifications to the variant system, that clay, the sprayers, uh, the screen sizes, laminar flow, and lighting. Uh, as I mentioned, we can't directly compare the silver carp hydrolysate to the autohime. Uh, the autohime has those marine sourced hydrolysates. It's very high quality, very expensive. Um, but the fact that it, it is uh, has performed similarly to that commercial diet um, here is promising for the industry in terms of moving away from marine sourced uh, ingredients, um, especially in this region where we have this resource of Asian carp that there's really no demand for. Um, so being able to turn it into an effective uh, larval feed um, in this region could be uh, very useful to the industry um, and the future of farmers in the region. Uh, thank you again for your time. I appreciate you joining me. Um, let me know if you have any questions. Feel free to reach out whenever. Thank you.